Welcome to the second in the series of Learning at Dernister. I'm Rabbi Zach Golden, and this is uh, bowler and scholar Henry Hollander. That's according to a postcard he has about himself. Um, Dare Nister, for those who don't know, is a startup uh, synagogue and cultural center in downtown LA that we're trying to helm and uh, get moving in these times. Um, part of what that means is uh, creating learning series with people we know that have interesting things that uh, we want uh, to have shared. Uh, it also means coming up with some high holiday services, all free um, services uh, as time goes on, featuring myself and Henry. Um, we're going to have a Yiddish discussion group with, if you'd like to introduce uh, who that is. Um, we're going to have a Yiddish discussion group with Shea uh, Kahana. Uh, Shea grew up in the, in the uh, Haredi community in Belgium. Um, he is currently here in Los Angeles and over the past two to three years he's been a correspondent for the Yiddish Forward. Uh, my friend Moshe Weilengold in New York, a mutual friend of the two of us, says that his Yiddish is a beautiful Yiddish, uh, not, uh, not an Americanized uh, uh, Yiddish, but, uh, but a, real, a real mellifluous uh, European Yiddish. So we're looking forward. We're looking forward to, to studying with him. That will, that will come after the holidays. And right now, we wanted to make sure everyone could have a nice shot of Henry's uh, bookstore, which is Hollander Books, uh, featuring uh, a wider range of Yiddish and German and other Jewish books. Um, and of course, it's an appropriate background. And what? Chaos. chaos, yes, and a lot of chaos. Is, is here. Um, but now I want to uh, get to the subject at hand. Um, we're going to, uh, well actually when I was first coming up with this series, my, the whole idea that we had was let's have people talk about what they're passionate about. And for those who know Leon, Leon is, you will know when Leon is passionate about something because it's a beautiful experience that everyone should partake in. And one day he calls me up he calls me up and uh, tells me about Albert Memmi, who I'd never heard of. And he told me all the intricate ways in which Albert Memmi dissected colonization and decolonization in a psychological lens and how Jews sort of fit into an awkward position in the middle that reverberates over time as Jews find themselves caught in this uh, awkward position over and over. And, um, and, as, and as for Leon, I thought, well, of course you would get interested in this because uh, Leon is a, uh, I believe, a senior at, at Brandeis. Uh, he is a, a very uh, keen scholar of, I would say, Jewish sociology and psychology and has a lot to offer and talk about, uh, about this. And I, I think also has a special uh, personal connection with Albert Memmi, not in the sense that Albert Memmi or, or he are related, but rather that, uh, as you'll see over time, they uh, they find that their views and way and ways of looking at things, um, in in an in a m honest, uh, psychologically probing and morally attuned way, are are really in in harmony with themselves. So, with that, Leon, would you like to add anything to that? Um, add anything in terms of an introduction, or do you want me to just get going? Oh, no, just uh, add uh, anything we should know about you that I didn't uh, really bring no, that's up. That's about it. My name is Leon. I'm a senior at Brandeis. Um, I'm like very much a lay person. I mean, I like have a minor in Jewish studies and whatever, but I'm kind of just a guy. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this for Dear Nister. Zach and I were in Yeshiva together a couple of years ago in Jerusalem. And I think this project is so exciting. Um, and I'm just really excited to be here. And like, thank you all for coming. I know some of you, I don't know most of you. I sort of know one of you. Um, so it's just, it's very exciting to see this array of people. Yeah, and um, for everyone who wants to follow along further, whatever further series or services that we end up having, just follow, uh, to, remember to follow their new series. Volume 31. Oh, uh. Uh, make sure to follow um, follow Darren Ister on, on Facebook, on, on YouTube, get on our mailing list on darrenister.org. Uh, 
And as for the format of this, I'm just going to ask Leon uh, a few questions, and then anyone who wants to uh, raise their hand and, and add in their own. I think somebody um, please do so. mute themselves. Uh, let me mute. Uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and mute everybody? Beautiful. Uh, yes, except for steps. Okay, good. Um, and yeah, and as uh, as a question, uh, as anyone has questions coming in like 20 minutes or a half hour in, uh, just raise your hand. I'll unmute you. Let's, and I want to hear. Uh, at what, what you have to say and also if you don't feel like particularly asking in person just put it in the chat um, and we'll and we'll get to it so uh, first of all Leon um, tell us about who Albert Memmi is uh, I know I hadn't heard of him before you mentioned to him to me what brought this up to you who is he yeah so sort of to provide a very cursory biography um, Albert Memmi, the, the reason why I'm interested in talking about Albert Memmi right now um, is that he just died. Um, he died earlier this year um, at the age of 99 uh, in Paris. And so for me, and again, sort of emphasizing like I'm a lay person, I'm bringing this in because I discovered Memmi recently and he was able to sort of clarify a lot of things about myself and sort of how I look at the world and how how the way that I look at the world is a Jewish way of looking at the world in a, in a, in a way that is historically contingent um, rather than sort of religiously abstract. Um, but, but, but for me, this is all sort of a tribute. This is sort of like, we just lost this like great master, this great sort of repository of Jewish collective experience and, and analysis. And so we should spend a little bit of time remarking on what we lost. Um, so with that sort of introduction, um, Memi was born in 1920 um, in Tunis in what he describes throughout his writing as the ghetto. Um, that's an interesting term to use. Obviously he's drawing that out of the European context. Um, I believe, I'm not sure that that word shows up first in Italy. Um, I think when I think of a Jewish ghetto, I tend to think of the Holocaust. Um, but Memi is describing the Jewish quarter uh, of Tunis um, and he's, although he never explicitly addresses, you know, why am I calling it a ghetto rather than, you know, a melach, which is like a traditional Arabic term, um, or why am I not just referring it to, uh, to it by its particular name of the Hara's particular place, um, you see in his writing that he views it as an environment that is both sort of intimate and therefore kind of warm and comforting and also just cramped also just sort of poor and deprived and separated. And so it's a very conscious choice when he calls it the ghetto. So he grows up just a little bit, actually I shouldn't say in the ghetto, he grows up sort of a stone's throw from the old ghetto in Tunis. His mother um, is illiterate. He's an illiterate Berber Jew. Um, and his father is a saddle maker. Um, and again, sort of bringing the comparison of Europe, you know, his father, this sort of poor tradesperson you know, who labors with leather, um, but who at the same time, you know, reads Hebrew, reads Aramaic, is sort of very pious in this very old world kind of way. I mean, it's it's very Tevye, the milkman. It's very European shtetl. It just happens to be in North Africa. Wow. Um, so he grows up there. Um, in his teenage years, uh, he joins a Jewish youth uh, movement and he becomes a Zionist. Um, and this is a little bit before the establishment of the state of Israel. This is prior to World War II. Um, and he is motivated um, to the Zionist cause for reasons that he sort of explores and articulates later in life. Um, but it comes out of this sense that he's, you know, I mean, I think in the same way that American teenagers join American youth movements, Jewish youth movements, go to Jewish summer camps. Like he has this piece of his identity that is not entirely congruous with the world around him and he wants to find a way to explore it. And he describes in his more autobiographical writing the way that this exploration was both sort of an affirmation of his Jewish identity and an attempt to really critically, you know, investigate it, right? The way that many people experiment with their Jewish identity sort of by rebelling against it, right? Being a Zionist in uh, Tunis, like being a Zionist at that time in any traditional religious Jewish community, was rebellious. You sort of had to lie to your parents about it. You, you know, he talks about um, people in his community 
who went to go live in Palestine and the way that they had to like smuggle themselves out. Um, it was a very controversial thing. Um, and then as he sort of ends his adolescence, he sort of drops the Jewish thing. Um, he, so he goes to an Alliance Israeli school. These were the schools that were set up around um, the sort of French colonized uh, Jewish world. Um, and he leans into his French education. He leans into his secular education um, and he is very interested in philosophy and he actually wins a big philosophy prize. Um, and that sort, of, that sort of sets the stage for the rest of his very long life and very long career, which is to say he spends the rest of his career at heart. Um, he, he spends it in the French language. He spends it engaged in a very philosophical enterprise, but he always has this sort of knot, a sort of K-N-O-T, this sort of like knot in his, in his identity, which is this Jewish thing. And he tries to sort of massage it and he tries to understand what it is and to clear up that tension. And from the attempt to relieve that tension, comes basically all of his work. Um, so sort of very quickly in terms of the rest of his actual life, um, when World War II happens, the Vichy government takes control of Tunisia. He uh, goes to a sort of some kind of labor camp. It's not a concentration camp, but it has a big concentration of Jews. Um, he escapes. Um, he uh, then spends some time in France following the war. Um, and it's in France that he becomes involved in the uh, anti-colonial struggle, um, sort of from a distance. Um, and I'm gonna be entirely honest, there are some particulars. He, he spent some time in Algeria studying. Um, he does spend some time back in Tunisia. I don't know the particulars of this. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of slide through it um, to get to his work. Um, but he gets involved in the anti-colonial struggle um, and he sort of joins this collection of of sort of North African intellectuals in exile who are writing about decolonization or the need for decolonization. Um, and that's when he writes this book in 1956 called The Colonizer and the Colonized, uh, which hopefully I'll have an opportunity to talk about in a second. Um, then Tunisia does gain independence. He actually returns um, and he's pushed out. And he's pushed out because he is identified sort of with the French. He's this Francophone intellectual. He speaks in terms of these French sort of enlightenment concepts. Um, and they're very nervous of him. Um, but his exile as an intellectual comes at the same time as the exile of the masses of Tunisian and other North African Jews, uh, basically just for being Jews. Uh, most of them are not intellectuals. Most of them, um, you know, actually were not for uh, decolonization, which is something that he writes a lot about. Um, but he sort of then becomes twice exiled. First, he's exiled because he's a North African in the country of his colonization. And then he's exiled back to that country um, because in his own country, he's viewed as a colonizer, right? Um, and once he returns to Paris that time, he never leaves, spends the rest of his life in Paris. Um, and he writes extensively about the decolonization process. And he writes extensively about what he calls the Jewish fate and Zionism uh, and the, um, the various current events about the state of Israel at any given time, um, as well as about sort of racism. Uh, he writes a book in the 80s called Racism um, and sort of prejudice and systems of oppression more generally. Um, he sort of pre stages a lot of our current discourse about privilege, about systems of oppression. Obviously, he's not the only one who's talking about this, um, but this is the language that uh, is sort of central to his writing, um, which is noteworthy since we're now in kind of a moment when that, that language has gone mainstream. Yeah. So, Leon, I, I, that, thank you so much for that, that introduction. I, I think that the figure of Memi as a person pushed out, as you said, from North Africa and then back and from France, um, moving, moving somewhere in between this uh, colonizer and colonized space caused them to have a lot of what seems to be, for us, contradictory uh, political views, like being a liberal Zionist, but also standing up for the rights of Palestinians. He has like a lot of different sorts of, of critiques of, of, of everybody, but 
you know, I think that his um, his willingness to critique and where he's coming from might make sense if you uh, describe like who are the who are is his milieu in France? Who is he hanging out with that is trying to sort of step back from tr from traditional politics and political uh, positions, from traditional ways at looking at things? Like he was spending time uh, with Camus and with and with uh, with other existentialists. Can you describe like what that environment did for him and like where did he fit in in that environment? Yeah, so um, the introduction to The Colonizer and the Colonized is written by Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, Sartre has this really interesting comment where he says, the difference between me and Memmi is that Memmi, I see a system where Memmi sees a situation. Um, and I actually think that we can pick apart that distinction that Sartre brings to sort of understand Memmi's place in his intellectual environment. Um, Memmi is always at home among people who are never quite at home. Uh, his description of what he calls the Jewish fate, um, which he views only to be remediable through a national movement, which in his view sort of through historically contingent reasons turned out to be the state of Israel. Um, Memi has a very interesting way of talking about Israel, um, where he says the Jews need a national movement. Why? Because without a national movement, you're always a stranger. You're always in, but never quite in. You're out, but you're not even really out. Because he says, he has a wonderful thing where he says, Israel allows Jews to assimilate. Hmm. Israel allows Jews to have a diaspora. Because a Greek American has an identity as a Greek. And he can choose to become an American or he can choose to go back to Greece, or he can choose to never see Greece, but he knows in his head there's this place called Greece, right? But the absence of any place to return to, he says, puts the Jew in this eternally vulnerable position, both in terms of his relationship to outsiders and crucially in terms of his relationship to himself. He doesn't know who he is, and he constantly struggles against his own positionality. And so in The Liberation of the Jew, which is a book that he writes in the late 60s, following up on his book Portrait of a Jew, he writes about the ways in which Jews try to solve their identity crises, whether by assimilation, which he says is never quite going to work. I'm sorry, let me hang up on the phone. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, he, he says about assimilation, um, he points out this very interesting. He points out that when Jews change their names into more Gentile passing names, they never change the name all the way. In other words, you never go from Cohen to McGillicuddy. You never go from Levy to uh, you know Smith. Instead, you pick a name that could be Jewish, could not be Jewish, right? You go like from the way my, my, my dad went from Goldstein to Golden, so there you are. Exactly. exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello? Yes. She's not. I'm sorry. She'll be here in like a couple of hours. All right. Take care. Bye. I'm sorry about that. That's, that's what the pandemic sort of era is. Um, so... I'm sorry that I've gotten sort of far afield of your question. Um, the question, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was right. It was, I was talking about like, like it's just interesting that he ended up in this very, this French philosophical bubble uh, or not bubble, but like a like group around him. And you, you answered the question. You said like he, they thought in terms of systems of systems of, of oppression, systems of colon, being colonized, systems of, of what happens when you're a colonizer. And he looked at things very situationally. And you were talking about like the 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 situational view of of whether of how Jews uh, sort of exist. Like you started bringing up the situation of, well, they can't. Re this is why they need a state because they can't really assimilate. You, you know, he does this interesting thing you talked to me about before, where he's actually a novelist before he starts writing his philosophical books. And but his philosophical books are are informed by being a novelist. And and that's and that's sort of how he he kind of differs, I think, 
um, from from others because he's looking at things situation to situation to situation. So you, what you were describing was it was like really the next step of the question of like what is the Jewish situation by situation in the colonizer colonized paradigm? And we were you were going with. Uh, the way that Jews can't really assimilate and for some reason don't really want to. Like, I gave up my so, name. So what's so interesting about the example of Jews who sort of change their name, but they don't entirely change their name, but they want some sort of plausible deniability, um, is Memi is very concerned with the idea that even if a Jew could escape anti-Semitism, the Jew never wants to escape anti-Semitism if the cost is rejecting his Jewish identity and by extension rejecting his Jewish community. That so long as there are Jews in the world, to say, I don't want to be one of you, I want to be somebody else, is a great insult to the people that you care about, right? And he says repeatedly, look, I'm not religious. I think this is all myths, right? He has a wonderful analysis of the Jewish religion in the liberation of the Jew, uh, in which he says, the Jewish religion is basically an attempt to, um, to, to, to mythicize and to justify the historical Jewish fate. Uh, in other words, what are the core tenets of the Jewish religion? That the Jewish people are chosen for a destiny which holds them to higher standards than everybody else and that all of the suffering that they endure is because they're not meeting that standard, right? So at least all of this awful killing and tragedy and poverty and deprivation, at least it's actually moralized. I mean, at least it's just in some sort of cosmic way that we can't quite understand. And it tells the Jews, after all of this uh, oppression and, and, and violence, one day in the future, there will be a messianic age, you will be redeemed, everything will be better. And so it's also a wish, right? Um, and he says, look, I have no time for that, right? That's not, that's constricting. Um, he, he, he writes there, you know, he says, whenever there's a conversation about, is there a Jewish culture? The Jews will respond. We have the Bible, right? Sure, um, you know, the best Jewish writers never mentioned their Jewishness. Sure, the best Jewish scientists, their science had nothing to do with their Jewishness. Yet, but we have the Bible. Isn't that the most Jewish book in the world? And he says, listen, do the Greeks go around talking about the Iliad and the Odyssey? The Greeks have poetry that they just wrote. Right. This is an artifact. This is the fact that you're talking about the Bible from forever ago means that nothing has happened since. Right. So he's, he's very, very um, critical of a, an attachment to Jewish tradition at what he views as too great a cost. But he says, I would never I would never abandon the Jews because so long as they exist, their suffering is my suffering. Right. And as a result, their identity has to be my identity because the identity is the reason that they choose to continue suffering, even when they believe that they might have an out, like assimilation or conversion. He doesn't believe those are gonna work, but he believes that people believe that they're gonna work and nevertheless, they choose to hold on to their identity. And for Memi, that's precisely the dynamic that holds back the colonized upon their, coloni upon their decolonization. So if I can sort of lay out yeah. The let's, let's go. Let's. Yeah, this is a really interesting entryway into explaining how the colonized colonizer dynamic sort of goes. So, Mammy writes this book in 1956, and this is sort of like his. I don't know if I'd call it his masterpiece. I mean, but this is the 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 book that puts him on the map. This is the book with which he's most identified. And what the colonizer and the colonized is, is it's a portrait in psychological terms not in material terms, but in psychological terms, of what it is to occupy any given role in the colonial system. And so he begins with a portrait of the colonizer. And he says, what makes a person a colonizer? What makes a person a colonizer is that they benefit from the subjugation of the colonized people. That their life is better because the life of the colonized is worse. Right. That's what it really means at the core to be a colonizer. Right. We can talk about these historical systems of and the Portuguese came and then they set up this. But, but, but when we say the word colonizer, the reason why that's so awful is because of this dynamic that one person benefits at the expense of somebody else. And he says the origin of every colonial ideological identity is a recognition of that fact on the part of the beneficiary, a recognition, in other words, of their privilege 
right? And I should note here that the American edition of the colonizer and the colonized is dedicated, quote, to the American Negro who is also colonized, right? So when we think about our own conversations about privilege, right, we should recognize on some level that in his conversation about colonization, right? That the colonizer wakes up one day, realizes that he's privileged in this way, that the privilege is totally unjust, that his life is better because other people's lives are worse through no fault of theirs and through no merit of his. And he's uncomfortable with that fact. It, 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 it bothers him. And he has a, a, an amazing statement in his book, Racism, which he wrote in the 80s, where he says, racism paradoxically is a good sign because the fact that a person needs to come up with an ideology to justify his domination of other people on no basis other than the color of their skin is a suggestion that he knows it's wrong. Because you can imagine an environment in which there's just as much oppression of black people in America, but the white people are comfortable with it. They don't see there's anything wrong. And so they just say, yeah, we're stronger, they're weaker, so we, we hurt them. The fact that they have to say, no, actually, we're better, they're worse, they need this, they can't do anything better, you know, it was inevitable. The fact that they come up with these ideological justifications means there's a guilty conscience there. And we can work with that, he says. And so in the case of the colonizer, the colonizer realizes that he's privileged because of the subjugation of the colonized. And then he has a couple of options. One thing that he can do is he can solve the cognitive dissonance by saying there's actually nothing wrong with this. The colonized are colonized because they are colonizable, because they can't take care of things on their own, because we have the mandate of heaven, et cetera, et cetera. These are the colonialist ideologies which justify the oppression. And he can become an ardent colonialist, right? And understand the distinction there. A colonizer is somebody who happens to be in the colonial relation. A colonialist is somebody who believes that that's the right thing to do, right? Or he can become an anti-colonialist. Right. And I would recall now the conversations like if you've read Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Kendi makes exactly the same kind of argument. Once you recognize as a white person that you benefit from the oppression of African-Americans, there's no neutral anymore. You either are effectively a racist because you promote this system of oppression or you choose to become an anti-racist and actively dismantle it. Right. So what do you do if you're a colonizer and you decide I'm an anti-colonialist? Well, you have two options. You can either up and leave the colony, you can go back to the metropole, you can go back to France, or you can attempt to throw your lot in with the colonized and to dismantle the colonial system from the inside. And Memi says, this is a really noble goal, but it's never gonna work. And the reason why it's never gonna work is because of who the colonized are by virtue of colonization. Because the colonized are not merely suffering materially from the extraction of their wealth and their labor and their et cetera, et cetera. And he's very critical of uh, sort of socialist reductionaries, right? People who say, all you have to care about is the economics of the situation. He says, that's not all you have to care about. In fact, that's not even the heart of the issue. Of course, the, the, the economic um, exploitation is what creates colonization. That's why colonizers colonize. And that's why they then create these justifications because they want to continue to extract the material resources from the colonized. But the real wrong of colonization is that it tells the colonized that they're lesser. It causes them to reject their own identity. And so the first stage in a decolonization process is to come to accept yourself as who you are. And as a result, the, the decolonizing process is primarily about the identity of the formerly colonized people, which is why a, col a formerly colonized people who assert their independence generally, he says, are not going to do so in a cosmopolitan way. They're going to do so via nationalist movements that assert themselves not as people in the abstract, but as Tunisians or as Algerians, et cetera. And what's the result of this? Why am I going on this whole tangent? Because the result of this is that the Tunisians, um, is, is, that, is that even if the Tunisians would rather 
achieve that status of abstract universal person. Even if they're, for example, not religious, they're not deeply Muslim, they're still going to spend a certain period of time embracing their Muslim identity because it was stigmatized by the colonizers, which is both why the Jews end up basically expelled from Tunisia because as a religious minority, they're perceived as sort of like a foreign body among this people which is finally asserting itself. And it's also why the secular Jew will never totally assimilate. Because so long as there are anti-Semites which tell him, your religion is bad, your identity is bad, your people doesn't exist. As a response to them, he will have to assert his own identity for the sake of his own dignity. And, 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 and in fact, so that's why for him, Jews who are secular, who live in the West, nevertheless will not fully assimilate because that would be an insult to who they are. But that's also why he understands why the Tunisians have a revolution that is basically hostile to him and his community. He gets it. He doesn't appreciate it. He doesn't approve of it. He doesn't want there to be a mass exodus of North African Jews, but he understands. And the, and the thread which runs through all of Memi's thought on the colonial situation, on the Israeli-Arab conflict, on racism, is I understand. The fact that I understand doesn't make it right that you're expelling the Tunisian Jews. The fact that I understand doesn't make it right that I'm a stranger in my own country. But I get it. And you can get it and you can critique it at the same time. No, and you know, I'm going to open this up for questions. Uh, so anyone want to raise their hand in the chat, and uh, you'll be free to ask. Um, but uh, to to go off of what you're saying, which is uh, interesting, is that because he is in the in, he has the interest of understanding the b both sides of the equation and all sides of the equation but yet is so strongly moralistic like he'll he'll choose the right he'll say as you i think we talked about this before he says self-determination is a right it's not it's not something you earn because you're you're doing the right thing he says all of these self-determinative struggles are the right ones um because they're right and and he wants ultimately speaking people to do the right thing and yet he's going he's laying out this perfect set of situations about why people are precisely going to do the wrong thing and ex exclude each other and in fact one of the things that sort of happens in this relationship of like define the colonizer is the tunisian identity becomes so boiled down to just muslim whereas before it, it did include jews it did include other people because they're you, their defiance against the colonizer is also uh, accepting the the simplification of their own identity, um, but but they're rebelling against it. But I I think what yeah what I wanted to sort of comment on is is like does is is he writing he's is he writing because he believes people can overcome this sort of situational psychology if they're aware of it as he is is that like sort of the existentialist bent that he kind of goes on or or does he have a different point of view than that so i think that the goal for everything that memi writes is for him to better understand himself primarily um memi starts with sort of an identity crisis when he's a north african studying in paris at the sorbonne he says, how come I'm an outsider, right? And, and he says, well, because not only do I not come from this country, I come from another country that was colonized by this country. And I think that's the entry point for him writing The Colonizer and The Colonized, is he wants to understand himself. And also crucially, he wants to understand the people around him. Because he says in the, in the preface of that book, I had friends who were, you know, I, I had professors who were French, who were the best people in the world who opened my eyes to philosophy, right? And yet, I also always felt that there was a discrimination between us that, that was deeply unjust, right? And, and, and so for him, you know, before there's any moralization, before there's any activism, there's just a desire to understand, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I do think that his sort of 
theory of change is that once you understand, then you can accommodate your own impulses, right? Once I understand why I want to lash out at you, only then, but then I'm able to decide not to, right? Um, and I really do think that he believes that whether it's between colonizer and colonized, whether it's between Jew and anti-Semite, whether it's between, you know, racial minority and racist majority, he does believe that reconciliation um, is possible. Um, by the way, not because he's Mr. Kumbaya, everyone should get along, that's the goal of everything, but because I think for him, all of these are sort of a waste of time. Um, you know, how, how many resources mentally, creatively, are we expending on these conflicts that we could spend, you know, making art and making literature and writing novels, right? Um, you know, he, he has this, he, he writes in Liberation of a Jew, I never wanted to be a Jewish writer. I just wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write about people falling in love. But if you fall in love as a Tunisian Jew, you fall in love as a, you don't fall in love as a person. You fall in love particularized in the particular relationship between yourself and your love object. And so if you write about that, you have to elaborate what is this political condition that has resulted in this relationship being what it is, right? Which is the, just for, for context, his first novel, The Pillar of Salt, is about a mixed relationship. Um, and 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 he was he, he was married to a Christian French woman who he met as a philosophy student. Um, and he writes about that. Like, you know, he's got, you know, he's like, I have no problem with, uh, with mixed marriages. I'm part of a mixed marriage. I love my wife. I love my children. Um, but it, it, it creates some tensions that I have to think through. And so I write about them. Right. And I think ultimately his job is to, is to resolve those tensions so that we can all just go on with our lives. Um, so, Th thank you. If anyone has a has a question, just uh, you know, find a way to raise your hand or um, unmute yourself. Even uh, I think we have enough people where where that's a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, the next place I would go from I here. Think there there yeah. was a question. Um, oh, there is one question. Yeah, you you are team, right? I said that right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, whoever it is, just unmute. Okay. Yes, it's Joachim. And I, I think I saw an interview with Memi in the 60s. And I remember that he mentioned that he had, he had a Zionist teacher or several Zionist teachers at the uh, Alliance School, which he attended. So I'm wondering whether his, his position might have been somewhat different from that of typical North African Jews. And also, I mean, Tunisia was different from Algeria. In Algeria, Jews were French citizens. They weren't in Tunisia. So th there might have been a big difference. And, you know, when it came to uh, studying in college, I read some of his works, but his engagement with Zionism was kind of weird because I don't think he ever read anything by Nordau or Herzl or Jabotinsky. Is, is that true? So the, the short answer is I don't know. Okay. But I, I, I don't know. Um, what I will say though, just personally having read Memi, it, it is interesting it, when you bring up his relationship to other writers that he, well, I'm curious, why, why, why do you say that it doesn't seem like he's read any of them? I'm, I'm, well, because Herzl, Nordau and Jabotinsky were all flaming racists and Nordau was actually pro-genocide and he believed in euthanasia. You know, it, it's almost as if, you know, if you read Mein Kampf, it's as Hitler took his ideas without appropriation and wrote them into Mein Kampf. So, but I guess what I'm curious about is, so, so, so one of the things Memi says, and I actually, you know, I, I have the books up in, a, in another window. I have the e-books, um, but, you know, Memi is, is very careful to distinguish between the political movement, which in a historical contingent way created the state of Israel and the necessity for something which does what the state of Israel does, which happens now to be the state of Israel. Um, like I, he believes that Jews need a national movement 
to provide them with a sense of identity and a sense of literal physical security. Um, he believes that Israel happens to be the vessel that created that. And that's what, that's what we have. I mean, he has a wonderful, he, he talks about um, the Ugandan uh, proposal in the liberation of the Jew. And he says, yeah, you know, probably uh, we should have taken this tract of land, um, you know, to move as many Jews there as possible because we were running away from the Nazis and that was the priority was save lives. And he says, I'm not particularly connected to this piece of land, but now that we have this piece of land, we better keep it, right? So I don't think it, it mattered to him very much, um, even if he would have agreed with those critiques of those Zionist writers because they were right. It didn't, it didn't really matter that they said a, a bunch of silly things, right? Well, you know, in the 30s, I mean, I'm actually an Eastern European historian. The vast majority, or at least a large, a large plurality of Jews, believed that Jews would be liberated via Marxist socialism. And not, you know, Zionists were actually much smaller, much a much smaller group until, say, 1936, 1937, 1938, than the ones who believed in Marxism. So yeah, it wasn't it isn't obvious that this was a necessary position. And one has to wonder whether the Jews would ever have been displaced from North Africa if the Zionists had not committed genocide in Palestine. Okay, so now so now let, let me respond to that. Um, so Memi writes a very important article in uh, I think the late sixties, uh, called something like Who is an Arab Jew? And he, he addresses exactly this claim, which is that prior to Zionism, the Jews and the Arabs, the, the Jews and the Muslims rather, may have had some differences, but basically everything was fine. And the only problem was what the Zionists did in Palestine. And he basically says, this is a completely ahistorical account. Um, no North African Jew would say something like this. Um, if you ask my father or my grandfather, what's the history of Jewish life in North Africa, they will tell you an answer very similar to what an old Russian Jew would say about life in Russia. It was a series of second class citizenships, a series of discriminations, you know, interspersed with pogroms and violence and expulsions. Um, they're going to give you just as lacrimose a conception of Jewish history as any pre-war European Jew would give you. And that's why he says, I was a Zionist as a teenager in Tunisia, because I knew that in the in the you know the same way that an emancipated Jew in Europe was supposedly equal, but they were in a context in which Christian anti-Semitism was baked in, right? I may have been in theory like anybody else, but my status as a dimmy, my status as a person of the book who was a protected but nevertheless second class member of the society was baked in because I was not a Muslim. So he really rejects this idea that we should view um, the, 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 the issues with the Jews in the Islamic world as a, as a result of Zionism. That's sort of number one. Um, number two, I think Memi would object, and I personally would object very strongly to the categorization uh, of anything that happened between Jews and Palestinians as a genocide. I think I'm gonna speak personally. I think it's a very reckless use of that term. Um, no, it's not. I, I am actually an internet. I actually work in international law, and it corresponds exactly to the definition that Raphael Lemkin proposed. If you look at the Nuremberg transcripts and you read the charges against the, the Nazi leadership, you will find that Germanization is a is a capital crime, and it's exactly what the Zionists called Judaization. Listen, you're welcome to yes. believe Murder that. Is not necessary for you, genocide. You are. You. I, I mean, you're welcome to believe that. I. I'm gonna say personally, since I'm the one speaking here, like for me, I think that that's a reckless use of the term. Okay, the third thing I want I, 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 Well, Leon, I, I wanna uh, move on to, there are other questions in the chat. Okay. Um, I, I, I just wanna say one more thing. Sure, I really sure, wanna say one more thing, which is you're right that Zionism was not the only Jewish, uh, you know, national liberation movement that was prominent in the post enlightenment period. The reason why it is now the most prominent is that the advocates of the other ones died because they were killed. And I, I wanna really emphasize to me, this is the great upshot of Emmy, of Memi. This is what Memi stands for, is that it may be the case that yes, it would be nice 
if commitment to Marxism liberated the Jews? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But it didn't. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we didn't have to engage ourselves in the dirty work of politics and of, of having an army and of all of the mistakes and crimes that come with freedom genuinely exercised? But guess what? We don't have that luxury. And what Memi is so afraid of is the way that ideologies dictate our approach to reality and cause us to deny reality rather than the particulars of reality creating you know a sort of a system by which we can think through what we need to do right um so you know to me this conversation about different national liberations movements is precisely to the point right it would be nice if those worked but they didn't and if we're so consumed in our ideologies uh that you know we, we, we resent the fact that we did the one thing that we could do that saved our lives, then we've taken a wrong turn somewhere. Now, I'll take another question. I'm sorry to harp on yeah, that. Yeah, uh, so I think uh, Marina has a question in the chat. I don't know if uh, she's interested in uh, asking it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can. Thank you. Um, I am from Argentina. I read Albert Memi as part of my Jewish high school education. I read Albert Memi in the conservative rabbinical seminary. I was extremely aware of his work. And it seems like in the US, no one knows about his existence, at least in the people I talk to. And I am curious if it is because of his ties to the left or and how do you frame that for the discussions we are having today? That's a great question. Again, you know, I'm not going to purport to know the answer as though I'm, I'm more of a scholar than I am. Um, what I will say personally, what I suspect is that it has less to do with his ties to the left than his, than, than both his Zionism and his critiques of post-colonial societies. Um, I mean, I think again, to sort of return to what I think is the, the upshot of, of Memi, the thing that we have to take away from Memi um, is that his answers are not satisfying. Um, they, 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 they do not start with an ideology and tailor the facts to meet that ideology. They say there's a particular situation between two particular people. And here are all the different things that play out in it. And I can understand what happens on either sides and both sides are making mistakes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the critiques of post-colonial uh, societies probably uh, don't survive as well in an American academic environment that speaking personally, I think largely tailors to providing American sort of white privileged college students uh, with uh, what they need to, to, to have a simple moral view of the world. I mean, I think that, that, that you know, when you can read scholars who say um, the, 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 you know, anyway, I, I, think, I think I made my point. I, I think, it's, I think it's, it's complicated and unsatisfying um, and I think that the American Academy um, has has sort of chosen largely a canon that is explicitly anti-Israel and that is very, very reluctant to criticize any actions of oppressed peoples across the board, uh, especially previously colonized peoples for what they do following their decolonization, which is exactly what Memi is so important for, is saying, yes, you're, I mean, Memi never, never, said that the Tunisians should not have become independent, even as he said it was inevitable that it would result in, a, in, an, in an exodus of Jews, because that was their mistake to make. That was their crime so to- would it, would it be fair to say that Memi is a victim of both sides? He's not left enough for the left and he's not right enough for the right. And that's why he becomes kind of his invisible person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, yeah. But that's not, and I want to be really clear, that's not because he's a centrist. That's not because he's a moderate, right? It's because he can look at a situation and say, you're right, but you're wrong. No, nobody wants to have that conversation. And it's the only kind of conversation that we can have without destroying each other. Um, the next question, Arya, you, you want to ask a question? Yes. Um, I want to preface this by saying that uh, I view the context I'm speaking from to be important as a assimilated Kurdish Jew who like rediscovered their heritage. Um, and so 
what I want to bring up that kind of problematizes this narrative of Zionism as being the only movement that survived was because to a certain degree, the Zionists sold out other liberation movements with um, active efforts at fostering um, anti-Semitism within regions in which it was it wasn't as prevalent for the sake of bolstering Zionist efforts and Zionist settlement of Palestine. Um, so my question is that like, and also I think it's important to note that, uh, for example, that like Kurdish Jews, for example, were often forced to um, be active colonial agents on behalf of Zionists and that Kurdish Jewish towns and settlements were intentionally put in between Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi set, uh, settlements um, for the sake of creating like a buffer wall so that if there was conflict and people died, it was Kurdish Jews, not Ashkenazi. So my question is like, do you, like how would how would you and how would you think he would approach this critique of like Zionism being at fault um, for the lack of liberation within the diaspora of of Jewish people? Um, how would yeah how how would you reply to that like that it's not so much Zionism only survived but Zionism ate other movements for its own survival? Thank you. That's a great question. Um... So I think, look, Memi was a fierce critic of Israel. I want to be very clear about that. Memi was a fierce critic of various Israeli actions. Um, and I think, speaking for myself, there's no question that the state of Israel has been systematically uh, racist against Mizrahi immigrants, uh, including people of backgrounds like Memi's. Um, you know, Somebody, Zach and I know um, a guy by the name of Yitzhak Karam, who is an academic uh, who lives in Israel, who has who has documented both in terms of the Yemenite uh, children's affair, in terms of the, the, the kidnapping of Mizrahi children, the medical experimentation that Mizrahi children were, experiment, were, were, were subjected to. Um, the state of Israel has a very messed up record with respect to um, Mizrahi immigrants. So for sure. I know that's not exactly your question, but I just want to sort of state it to be clear. Um, with respect to your particular critique, I don't know enough about it to comment. I don't know what Memi wrote or didn't write about it. What to me, and I, I'm going to keep saying this, the takeaway from Memi is that we shouldn't be afraid to make those sorts of comparisons so long as we don't see ourselves disfigured into irrational or uh, you know grotesque people as a result of making those critiques. So in other words, I think Memi's view of the Zionist movement and of the state of Israel was they did a lot of bad things. They do a lot of bad things. I also understand why they entered into a process of asserting material power in which they were going to make those kinds of mistakes. And given that on balance, it's really good that we have a Jewish liberation movement I'm still committed to that project, even as I make those critiques. And in fact, my making those critiques is what legitimizes my support of the project, and my support of the project is what legitimizes those critiques, right? So if many was able to say of the Tunisians, I understand why they expelled me, and it's good that they had the ability to do that because it means that they were free and there is no excuse for colonializing them, I think in the same way he would say we can make every critique in the book of the Zionist movement, of the state of Israel, um, and they may be true, and we should rectify the wrongs. And we can do that from a place of still understanding why in a historical context, those sorts of things would happen as an oppressed people attempts to liberate itself, right? Does that, does that, is that at all satisfactory as an answer? Um, yeah, I appreciate that response and that view. Um, I think, I, th I think, to a degree, like, I haven't personally read Mammy, but from what I can pick up from what you have shared, um, it seems like his work kind of, I can see impacts on it on the works of other Middle Eastern um, marginalized theorists, like the likes of Ojalan, where it's almost like people are writing in reaction to Mammy in opposition, um, viewing colonialism, because like, for example, a lot of Kurdish theorists, non-Jewish Kurdish theorists, 
um, position colonialism as an active effort that is done domestically and internally against people who don't fit the narrative of of a national liberation movement. Um, so, for, so like making the argument that, for example, if there was to be a Jewish state or a Kurdish state, that that it to define it necessi- necessitates defining an opposition, something that is not Jewish, something that is not Kurdish, and that the histories within the Middle East are so interwoven and so gradient that that will necessitate an internal and externalized colonialism and violence, um, which is why a lot of Middle Eastern theorists, including Kurdish liberation theorists and Palestinian liberation theorists, are pushing for a post-state or anti-state approach um, for national liberation, i.e. like, like it's not necess- like, like the method to liberation wouldn't be necessarily a Jewish state, but the abolition of a state in which a la- an empire that allows the colonialism of Jews to happen and the colonialism of anyone to happen. So, like, I appreciate your response, and it has given me, like, insight into the development of ideas and how some theorists may be directly impacted by and responding to Memi. This is, that is so interesting. Thank you so much for that. And then I I also want to say, I think Memi never wants to give up on those big ideas and those big aspirations. Um, I'm going to invoke, again, Sartre's distinction of of a situation versus a system. I think Memi would agree. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what Memi's thoughts were in terms of like these big political questions about states and whatever, but I think he would agree, we can oppose the systems while we still attempt to rectify the particular situations. And I think he's very afraid of this idea that until we can fix the system, we can't solve the situation or make the situation any better, right? Like we should be able to have our long-term goals of let's get rid of states, let's get rid of nationalities, let's get rid of all of these things, and also recognize that so long as those exist, we can take actions to equalize the relations between people who are enmeshed in those systems that we're trying to dismantle in the long term, right? Um, I wanna- Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. I Max the question, but also some other people. um, Yeah. Adam made a question here. Yeah, no, there are a couple more questions to go. I just want everyone to know that it's uh, it's almost one, we're gonna keep going as long as there are questions uh, or, you know, to a reasonable point, just wanted to make sure everyone knew if they were keeping track of time for any given reason. I just wanted to add on to the on to the question of Ashkenazim sort of agents into the Middle East that I remember reading in my study of uh, the last chief rabbi of the Ottoman Empire, Hambashe Nahum Effendi, was that he was often complaining about the Zionists sort of coming in and roughing up his relationship with the Sultan, but he couldn't he couldn't win that battle because Zionism, even though it ha- was like sort of run by these Ashkenazi German agents, uh, was so incredibly popular that it sort of took off more like by wildfire in Istanbul than it did in maybe a lot of other places in Europe, especially Western Europe. So it it, it creates a sort of a complex questions of like the outsider versus insider distinction on that, I think. But um, I don't know. Maybe that's just throwing that out there. Can I say a couple of I, I'm sorry to yeah. I'm going back and forth, but yeah. can I, I I want to read something. I just pulled up a thing from Liberation of the Jew to go back to Arya's question just for one second, if that's all right, Zach. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we'll move on to Adam's question and then Zusha's. Okay. He says, a people, he says, um, perhaps it is deplorable that humanity is divided into peoples. Possibly one day it will become a unified body with one culture. Meanwhile, peoples do exist, and particularly thanks to their collective psyche. And he says, and he says, um, so, so in other words, right, he says, maybe we should get rid of these things, but so long as they exist, we have to deal with them. I think that's important. Sorry, we can go on to Adam. All right. A- yeah, Adam, go ahead. You're up. Sure, thank you. Um, so this is all very fascinating, and I, you know, as a disclaimer, I am not, um, I am neither well-versed nor well-educated on many of these subjects nor the people. Um, but, you know, Leon, I hear you talking about sort of this, this embracing of unsatisfactory solutions um, and, and unsatisfactory ideas and, and the um, cognitive dissonance of, of the idea versus the situation uh, or, the, or the general versus the situation. Um, but I think that can be a difficult thing to do 
um, at least certainly as far as I see in our modern lives from a perspective of, um, of the media that we consume and is presented to us. Uh, and so I, I kind of wonder, this is, this is perhaps a Memi question and a perhaps a question for you based off of your readings of Memi, of how do we take that idea of embracing the both the general and the situation and try and and shape the kind of media we consume or the people we talk to um, so that we're able to to wrestle with that if that's a, a meaningful question that's a great question I think that's a great question to me what I keep referring in various terms as the upshot of of, of Memi's work is the precondition for figuring out an answer to that question, which is to say the ability to read somebody's perspective, to understand their perspective, to empathize with their perspective, not even necessarily to judge their perspective, even while you critically assess their practical suggestions or their actions. I, I think we live in a media environment right now. Like I'll give you an example. Um, the way that the Jewish press talks about Louis Farrakhan, this is a great, anybody who is associated with Farrakhan is like persona non grata, right? Now, here are two facts, here are three facts about Farrakhan. He is an anti-Semite and a grifter, period. He also has taken the reins of an organization, the Nation of Islam, which was really important to a lot of people in particularly the 20th century. I mean, his incarnation of it is kind of like LARPy, you know, you know, it's not, but, 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 right. Um, the third thing, which I always feel is important to note when we're talking about the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan is that for decades, Louis Farrakhan bragged about being involved in the assassination of Malcolm X, which you would think would be a bigger deal, right? I mean, like the anti-Semitism is bad. It's also bad that he bragged about participating in the assassination of Malcolm X. In any event, you have to be able to understand why, for example, Tamika Mallory, who was one of the co-chairs of the Women's March, why is Tamika Mallory so attached to the Nation of Islam? Because the Nation of Islam showed up for her when she needed it to. Why did so many African Americans in the 20th century follow the teachings of the creator of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, who preached, among other things, that white people were created in a lab by an evil scientist named Yacoub, right? Like, that's a bad belief, right? But you also can understand when the Nation of Islam provided black communities with a certain structure, with a certain dignity, why people supported them, right? Um, and, and, and if we excise, so, 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 so we have this trap when it comes to Farrakhan, who I think is a good example, where certain people refuse to criticize people who uh, endorse Farrakhan, who platform Farrakhan, right? So that, so that when, when a Jewish community says to a, a black leader or a Muslim leader, can you please denounce this awful thing that Farrakhan said the other day about the synagogue of Satan, or at the very least, can you not retweet him, right? You get this avalanche of people who say, how dare you? He's important to the community. He did all of this good work. It's not about you. Be a better ally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's a mistake because we live with these people and we need to understand their point of view and their, their point of view is justified in certain crucial ways. However, there's another trap, which is to say, we can't allow anybody who has anything to do with him, we can't allow him, we can't allow anything we need to, and, and that's the cancel culture impulse, right? That's the political correctness impulse, right? And I think both of those are toxic. I think we need to be able to read people who come from oppressed backgrounds. We need to have dialogue with people who advocate radical solutions. And we need at every point to be questioning their bad takes, right? And I think we, we, we have a, a discourse environment right now that is afraid to do both of those things. And as a result, the only people that platforms are these kind of like vapid, you know, um, sort of big brain, blue check mark people um, who don't have anything particularly interesting to say um, but at least they don't have anything offensive to say. I think that's a disaster. Uh, all right, Zusha, if you want to go ahead. Hi, um, this is so great. Um, thanks, Leon, for, for, for doing all this. 
I guess uh, I, I wrote my question. I'm just going to read it. I don't know. Um, do you think that there could be such a thing as like a Memian politics uh, or a Memian activism? Um, you were saying at the beginning that Sartre made this distinction between um, uh, his, like what he calls system would be for Memian situation. Um, do you think that that can be like activated in some way towards change making, um, like a Memian praxis to some degree? Um, I think that Marusha also had a response here, which I thought was interesting. But otherwise, uh, Leon, I wanted to see what you thought about that, if that makes sense as a question. Yeah, thank you. So I, you know, my discovery of Memi happened basically after he died, um, just very recently. Um, and it happened at the same time as, you know, you can use whatever term you want, this sort of national reckoning about race, et cetera, et cetera following what happened in Minneapolis and, and in Kenosha. Um, and I think on some, you know, we don't create, we don't have a politics and then create a discourse. We are situated in a historical context that plays out every day. And when certain flashpoints emerge, we then have to talk about them. And our policy, emerges as a result of what our discourse looks like on those flashpoints, such that whatever we do about police brutality, whatever we do about the segregation and wealth, you know, theft of black community, what, et cetera, et cetera, is going to come out of how we talked about these flashpoints this summer and various other things. And I think the way that we've been talking about it has been really bad. And I'm going to make this here a concrete example of what I was trying to, maybe Farrakhan was too abstract, but what I was trying to say in response to Adam's question, which is there's this conversation about rioting, right? Um, and basically, it seems to me that you're sort of hearing two voices. You're hearing this one voice, which is coming from not just the sort of the left, but sort of like the, the NPR, New York Times, sort of like broad progressive upper middle class white consensus, guilty white consensus, you would call it, right? Um, and, and, and that is, um, listen, these people have inherited 400 years of oppression. Um, they just watched a member of their community get murdered on the street by a representative of the state. Um, and you're upset about the windows of a target? Like, what's wrong with you, right? This is rage. It's directed against a system that could give a crap about them, right? And how dare you condemn the rioting and how dare you condemn the looting, right? There's a real moral truth there, right? Now there's another point of view that jumps in that says, excuse me, I can recognize all of what you just said. And also the guy who ran that liquor store in Minneapolis that got burned down was a Holocaust survivor. And how do you think he feels about having his livelihood destroyed? How do you think this guy feels who was in the shop that was burned down and he burned down in it, right? You know, how, how dare you justify looting and rioting when it serves no strategic benefit and it ruins people's lives? And isn't that just an expression of your privilege, NPR writer, you know, that you're not an immigrant shopkeeper, you know, and you can afford to lose your things because they're just things for you because you have a lot of things, right? These are both true, right? And a Memian praxis with or a Memian discourse to me would say, we understand the deep injustice that provokes the legitimate rage that results in the riot. And we can ask critical questions about A, what are the harms that people suffer as a result of the riot? And B, is there any strategic benefit? Because if there is, maybe it's justified. But if there isn't, then it's very hard to justify. And we can have that conversation in an, intel in an intelligent and a mature way, which is a conversation he explicitly has in The Colonizer and The Colonized about terrorism. He says, I understand why they do terrorism. They shouldn't do it, right? Um, so, so that's part one, is about the discourse. In terms of policy, though, I think this is a really important, important point. Memi repeatedly says, and he says this especially in his book, Racism, which is written in the 80s. Um, it's the same idea that Ibram Kendi says in his books. 
which is it's not that there are racist ideas and then on the basis of those racist ideas, people create systems of exploitation. It's the other way around. People create systems of exploitation because they're greedy or whatever. And then because they have a guilty conscience, they create ideological justifications for those systems, right? And so for Memi, when you're looking at a, a, a situation of oppression or, or colonization of, any, of some sort, you have to deal with the objective conditions rather than get lost in this conversation about the justificatory ideologies. So in the case of racism in America, I think Memi would say, look, uh, you know, don't, don't talk to me about hairstyles and, you know, this, like, let's have a conversation about, um, you know, like, why is the net worth of a black family a tenth of the net worth of white families? Because the wealth was stolen. So let's redistribute that wealth, right? Why, why are the schools in this community poor and bad at educating their kids? Because the schools are funded by property taxes and you've deprived the owners of the homes of the ability to have meaningful property. So they can't tax their schools. So let's change the way that we fund schools, right? I, like, I think, I think Memi would say, if we're having a reckoning about race in this country, let's start by fixing the inequities. Let's have a serious material reparation and we'll reconcile afterwards because it'll be a lot easier because we'll all have a lot less to lose. Right. Yeah, and uh, let's go with uh, one more question from Max, and then uh, we'll we'll end it after that. But uh, we'll keep the uh, the Zoom going. I'll just end the recording and the streaming, so uh, we can all uh, get to know each other uh, a little bit, if if anyone would like. Uh, so, Max, uh, you've got the floor. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Leon. This has uh, been really informative. And really great. Uh, so thank you for this. Um, so I guess the the only thing that I want to kind of challenge and, and I, I'm having thoughts about is this conception of uh, Jewish assimilationism, right? And 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 being an assimilationist as opposed to you know being adamant and and um, uh, very concrete in your identity and particularly as a minority group that has this kind of historical sense of oppression and judgment that that you know pervade so many centuries in different groups and different geographies. So I, I think it's interesting what you were saying before about, you know, the uh, Jewish people will not necessarily assimilate because there's this kind of notion or this uh, contextualization of, um, well, I'm a Jew and I understand what it's like to be a little bit different. So, you know, even if I marry a, you know, a, a, a white non-Jewish woman and I have Christian kids, like, and, and, and I guess I just want to challenge that notion because I, I think I think one of the things that's really definitive right now in um, and I and you definitely touched upon this, but but I, my my issue and my question is basically, do you think there has to be a particular kind of of context for Jewish individuals to be adamantly and certifiably invested in their Jewish identity, as opposed to what we've seen in America in the last forty or fifty years, which in my sense has been. Uh, in many circles, a complete abandonment of Jewish identity, and 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 and, and, I, and I don't want to I don't want to make too much commentary about this, but I will say I think a lot of what's happening now, a lot of the pressure and crux of what's happening with, um, you know, different forms of supremacy, like you talked about with NOI, like you talk about with with white supremacists, has been this reawakening and, and reemergence of Jewish identity, and I and I and I want to know your thoughts on that, um, as opposed to you know this is 1975 and like. I'm an assimilated Jewish person with a with a white Christian wife, and my kids are Christian, and you know it is whatever it is. So, in, in other words, is so the question, as I understand it, is the fact that there is what Mammy would call a Jewish fate that right. a person inevitably finds himself in is that a sufficient substitute for yes. an engagement with tradition, et cetera, et cetera? Is that yeah. so? That's a good question. I mean, I think for Mammy. Um, What's so, it's so interesting. So like I said about racism or colonialism, Memi always believes that the objective condition comes first and the ideology comes second, right? And he believes that about racism and about colonialism. He also believes that about Judaism. Hmm. So he says that when you read the Bible or the Talmud or the Kabbalah or whatever, you're reading a people's act of interpreting their lived experience. Mm 
right? Now, that, so, so I, I think that's an important thing to recognize, that for him, Jews come first chronologically, right, and conceptually, Judaism comes second, sure. which means, that, this isn't answered your question yet, but which means that to say, you know, you've lost the plot. Jews only are Jews insofar as they keep the halakha and they go to shul and they have this Jewish idea. He goes, you're completely missing the point. You've gone incoherent, right, at that point. That I live in a particular slice of the Jewish communal experience that is situated in space and time, right? Now, that doesn't give me access to what the rabbis of the Talmud were experiencing and thinking. It doesn't give me access to what the exiles from Spain were thinking and praying. But it's, it's made of the same stuff that the Kabbalah is made of. It's made of the same stuff that the Talmud is made of. It's made of the same stuff that the Bible is made of, which is just subjective human experience when situated in an objective social world, right? So I think that's, sort of, that's the first thing that I want to say. In terms of like an answer to your question, um, Memi is very critical. I mean, in the way that he is of everybody, he's deeply understanding, but very critical of um, Jews who want to have this kind of like halfway house identity, right? Who want to not be too Jewy and not actually pray and learn, and, and, but, but they still want to be proud of who they are, right? Um, and he's, he's critical of it, not because he thinks it's wrong, but because he thinks it, it, it doesn't solve the problem that the Jew in question is trying to solve, which is the Jew has an identity crisis, right? And, 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 and the Jew embraces his identity as a means of solving that crisis, but if he doesn't know what that identity is, he won't get anywhere, right? And so, and so I think Memi's point of view is people should have an identity that works for them, not an identity that is an attempt to solve some ideological prescription which means they shouldn't be religious if they don't believe. They shouldn't assimilate if they don't, if they feel like that's a betrayal of their identity, right? Um, you know, th is that at all? I know that's not a, a real answer to your question, but I, but I think it, that's the way he's thinking about this. And also, yeah. Yeah, yeah. why Zionism is important for him is so that Jews can assimilate. I mean, he, he right. said, here, can I, if you give me one second, I can pull up a, uh, I can pull up a quote. Um, he says, um, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, he says, we need to create an objective situation in which one can live if one wants a free and secure and, and, and fulfilled life as a Jew in their particular religious tradition and culture, etc. And once that exists, then the Jew who doesn't want to do that will be free not to do that without guilt. Right. You know, I, that's, that's actually a great place. Yeah. That's actually a great place to go because um, uh, this is the ideal of Der Nister. Der Nister, as uh, Henry and I have described uh, for us, is an immersive Jewish environment. That's what we want to create. We're trying to create uh, a situation where any particular angle that you feel comfortable or want to feel comfortable with a section of your Jewish identity that is not made to feel comfortable in the outside world or in Jewish places that are, are filled with tension about needing to represent themselves as well assimilated uh, or otherwise uh, elsewhere, this is, this is uh, a home for you. This, this is meant to be an experiment to see that maybe, uh, maybe people are ready to become comfortable with who they are, whether it is in an intellectual way, whether it is in, their, in, our, in a, a, a given cultural tradition, whether it's a, a, an Eastern European one or a North African one or wherever. And uh, yeah, that's the ultimate goal. And um, to that end, I want to invite everyone to like us on Facebook, sign up for our newsletter, so we can send you the recording. It'll be on YouTube, on our YouTube uh, page. And uh, before I stop uh, recording and streaming, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who came. This is uh, just an incredible group of people, and I'm so happy that you came. And thank you to everyone who's watching. Thank you to everyone who will be listening. 
afterwards or watching afterwards and most of all thank you so much leon this was just absolutely incredible and i really really appreciate that you would do this for for this for the synagogue and for for yeah. everybody to know um, what are we doing now are we keeping the zoom open or uh yeah i'm gonna keep the we're and now we're gonna people please feel free to leave don't yeah, don't yeah. feel like you have to stick around